But the only cure for this restlessness that's in our hearts is found, beloved, in knowing that our future, though unknown to us, is secure in Christ. I talked to a young man a few days ago, and he had received some not terrible, terrible, distressing news, but he, he felt like his life was on a journey headed to one direction, and lo and behold, he had received the news that he wasn't going to be going that direction anymore. It was distressing for him. Beloved, this restlessness that comes into our hearts. Now think with me about this. There was a, a great writer of years gone by, Augustine. I, I do not agree with the man on the vast majority of his theology, some people would dislike him so much that they say, I don't even know if he's saved. Well, I'm thankful I don't have to determine whether or not he knows the Lord. I'm thankful the Lord is the one that will take care of that. But he had issued a statement one time. He said, our hearts are restless, and they will find no rest until they come to rest in thee. Is that not a beautiful expression? Our hearts are restless. We, we, we don't know. And they will find no rest until they come to rest in thee. But we see the drastic, beloved, the drastic measure that the circumstances for Joseph and his brother had changed there, particularly for his brethren. And notice there in verse number four then, the Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me. Now once again, beloved, as I think about this, and I think once again about being a fly on the wall in this meeting here, when Joseph's brethren, they had no idea who he was. And then Joseph says, Hey, I'm your brother. Beloved, I do not know what was taking place. But apparently they didn't rush to hug Joseph. Probably in their minds they're there saying, is it payback time? Is he going to have the swordsman come in and take our heads off? What's he going to do next? In other words, his brethren are standing back with their eyes probably the size of saucers. And they're saying, what's about to befall us? And their minds are no doubt also rehearsing the fact of, do you remember when we threw him in the pit? Do you remember when we heard him crying? Brothers, brothers, don't do this to me. Don't be goofing off like this. I'm scared. They wouldn't listen to their brother's voice. Can you imagine when they sold Joseph off into slavery? And lo and behold, they sold him to the Midianite merchant. And lo and behold, can you imagine Joseph being taken off with chains on his wrist, being led along in a wagon train, or possibly in a cage? Can you imagine him crying out to his brothers? Please don't do this to me. In other words, I don't believe Joseph was there saying, yippity do die, yippity day, what a great day it is to be alive. Beloved, I believe Joseph was distraught when he was in the pit. I believe he was distraught when he was sold into slavery, as any normal human being would be. But the point is, beloved, in the minds of his brethren, I wonder how many times the cry of their brother had haunted them through the years. Because we see, see uh, the brothers over and over again saying, our sins found us out, our sins found us out. You know what's going on now. But now, beloved, they're standing there before Joseph, and the Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I... And Joseph, your brother, your brother, I'm sorry, whom ye sold into Egypt. Their mind still had to be running a million miles an hour. Had to be. Because the fact, too, that Joseph said, come near. You see, if there was someone here in the church and I hadn't seen you and I greatly love you, I haven't seen you for a year or 20 years. When I finally see you, boy, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm probably going to rush on you pretty quick and I'm going to hug your neck. But Joseph, he says there, and he said unto his brethren, come near to me. In other words, his brethren, it seemed like they're, just, they're kind of standing back, keeping their distance to the point Joseph has to say, I'm your brother. Come over here. The Bible says there, it goes on to say, now once again, evidently the look on the face of his brother, his brethren, it's very telling because he says there in verse number five, now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Amen. Oh, beloved, think about this now. Think about that which is before us. You know, there are some people who they develop bitterness in their life, and they will die with bitterness in their soul. Have you ever met anyone like that? Maybe something happened to someone 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And lo and behold, there's bitterness there. 
And they may learn to keep it well guarded. They may learn to keep it well camouflaged. But lo and behold, sometimes someone will have bitterness in their heart and they will carry it to the grave with them. In other words, whenever you sit around and talk to them, maybe at a time in private, they say, well, I'll tell you what, I was hurt 20 years ago and I just refused to let it go. You know what? That doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do anybody any good whatsoever. I've met people who maybe they were in a grocery store robbery and they say, well, I'll tell you what, ever since that grocery store robbery, I just don't trust people. Well, you're going to lead a miserable life unless you learn to get over it. I'm just so angry with him. I'm so angry with her because of what they did to me 20 years ago. Is it helping you out to live with that bitterness? Absolutely not. We appreciate what someone had said. Someone had said that uh, hiding bitterness in your heart and consuming that bitterness and being consumed with that bitterness, it is like drinking poison hoping that the other person dies. So you're the one that's being poisoned by it. You're the one that's being affected by it. It's your life that's being ruined by it, and yet you keep holding on to it. Now, once again, think with me about this. Joseph could have sat there and said, you know what? He could have been there in Potiphar's house, and he said, Man, I'll tell you what, when I see my brethren again, I'm going to punch those fellows in the nose. I'll tell you what, especially my brother Reuben, he was the one that should have stepped in, and he could have got up every single day of his life and said, man, when I see my brethren, I may have to pick them off one at a time, but those brothers of mine, I'm telling you what, they're going to have a price to pay when I see them. Joseph could have been consumed with that. Could have been, he wasn't, but he could have been. But I know a lot of people who have that tendency that they will take and hold that bitterness in. But if Joseph is there telling them, now notice the great news there. He says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there, I'm sorry, and yet there are five years in the which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. In other words, Joseph's telling them the famine's still got another five years to go. And Joseph, once again, he says there, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now notice this, beloved. Joseph continues to give glory to God. Joseph doesn't say, well, look who I've grown up to be now. I'm the big boy now. Now I'm the one that's going to deliver you, fellas. No, 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 no. Joseph continually gave glory to God and said, God sent me before you. Joseph honored the Lord in all of those things. Now, beloved, we must also remember with regards to Joseph's attitude, as well as the setting before us, that Joseph was able to not only see God's divine hand of providence moving in his life, but he was also able to take and console his brothers with the providence of God. Now, here's the thing, beloved. Once again, with regards to personal application, I wonder how often times are we able to see the, pro the divine providence of God working in our lives and thank the Lord for it? We oftentimes reckon that I haven't had a flat tire for years, but oftentimes we use that as an illustration. In other words, you're driving one day to work, you get a flat tire, you're running late to work, you've had a rough morning and everything else, and you get a flat tire and you're sitting there beside the highway and you're thinking, I've got to get my crazy jack out, I've got to get my crazy spare tire out. I hope the spare's got air in it. I guess I could try to call trip away. I wonder if there, in other words, that mindset, beloved. But how often are we able to take and say, you know what, God wanted me to have this flat tire I don't understand why. I may know why he wanted me to have this flat tire later today, and I may not know until I get to heaven, but it was by divine order from God himself that I have this flat tire here today. And so because God has allowed me to have this flat tire, maybe a fellow motorist is going to stop by to lend me a hand, and that's the person God wants me to witness to today. How often are we able to acknowledge and see the providence of God at work in our lives as Joseph did? And I believe also that that's what allowed Joseph to deal with it with such a wondrous attitude and testimony. And Joseph, once again, in verse number 8, sort of the same thing. He says, so now it was not you that sent me hither. How many times is Joseph going to say this? And yet they needed to hear it. So it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Once again, Joseph giving the glory to God there. Joseph's not there saying, do you guys remember those dreams? Remember I told you about the dream? Remember how mad you got at me when I told you about the dreams that I had? Boy, you guys were furious. Well, do you see now? Do you... That wasn't Joseph's attitude. 
Joseph didn't have an I told you so attitude. But beloved, over and over again, he pointed out that the Lord had done those things in his life. He goes on to say, haste ye and go up to my father and, and say unto him, thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen and thou shalt be near unto me thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast and there will I nourish thee for yet there are five years of famine lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Joseph doesn't have a bitter bone in his body. He goes on to say there and behold your eyes and behold your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that have seen, all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Can you imagine, beloved, the crying fist which has taken place? The glorious reunion there when they finally were able to reveal all these things. It says, moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. After that, his brethren talked with him. So we have, beloved, this entire passage here where seemingly, and according to the wording, the way the Spirit of God has given it to us, all this time the cat had the, had the tongues of all of Joseph's brethren where they weren't able to talk to him. But now the Bible says, uh, moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. It goes on to say there, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh will and his servants. You know, beloved, as I was meditating on these verses today, I was wondering, you do not have to know someone for very long before you end up asking about their family. Well, what was your mom like? What was your dad like? Are they still living? Have they passed away? Were you close to your mom? Were you close to your dad? Do you have siblings? Well, it makes you wonder exactly what the people there, including Pharaoh, thought about Joseph. It makes you wonder, did Joseph ever talk about his brethren? Did he ever talk about his dad? Did Pharaoh know what was going on? Because the Bible says, and the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well, and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beast, and go and get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, This do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt, for your little ones and your wives, and bring your father and come. And regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Beloved, this is a phenomenal picture of salvation as well in regards to the fact that not only was the request made for them to come down there, or the requirement actually, but they had also made a way for them to come by way of their wagons. And I want you to notice there in verse 20 where the Bible says, And regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Regard not your stuff. How many people have been somewhat hem hindered, humanly speaking, from entering into the kingdom of God because they're regarding their stuff? Their stuff. Maybe you say, well, Brother Spears, who was ever, who ever had that problem? Well, I remember there's a story given to us in the scriptures where there was a rich young ruler. And the Lord Jesus Christ ended up telling him, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the Bible says that that young man went away very sorrowful for he had great possessions. You know what his problem was? He was regarding his stuff. Beloved, the truth is that there are some people who are not yet saved and they will take and say, well, you know what? I, I have a membership at the local bar. I, I have a membership to this, or I have a membership to that, or I have filthy magazines in my house, whatever it may be. And they'll sit there, and they will regard their stuff as they consider being a Christian. Maybe they'll take and say, well, you're telling me I have to repent of my sins? I mean, no more alcohol in my life, no more wild women. I can't go around and live the way that I want to. You need to repent of your sins, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You need to be willing to repent of your sins to turn from those things. And yet, beloved, it is true and applicable to the lost, but it's also equally true as well to the saved people. 
Think with me about this. How many times do you know, Christians, that we can come to the place that we are materialistic? We're materialistic. In other words, we reach that point in our lives that we begin to regard our stuff. I've actually had times several years back, uh, a, um, I, I can't really go into all of it, but someone had been in our home, and then I came to the place I didn't know if I could trust the individual. It was a total stranger. I had the individual into my home, and then I got to thinking, well, you know, all these questions that they were asking me, and that was on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, I got to thinking about it. I thought, what if they were just here to case my house out? Is case still a word? Does that still make sense? To case out a house. In other words, they, they have come in to make plans to rob me. They sit there and say, well, what are your hobbies? I say, well, I enjoy guns. I enjoy hunting. Well, you know what that probably told them? There are firearms in the house. What else do you enjoy in life? Well, I enjoy uh, working on cars in their mind. They say, well, I have tools in the house. Now, the point is, the next morning when I got ready to come to church, to be honest with you, I want to blame the devil, but it's just my wicked flesh. When I came to church, I got to think, maybe I should just stay home and guard my house. What if they come back and rob me? What if they come back and get on my gun like a crazy person? I sat there last night and basically told them everything I was interested in. I was much like Hezekiah in the fact that I told them about all the kingdom. And when I was here in church the next morning, I was kind of thinking, man, am I going to get home or my house going to be robbed? Maybe I can send some men to go there and watch the house while I'm here preaching. You know what I was doing? I was regarding my stuff. I was thinking more about my possessions, my stuff, than I was being here in the Lord's house. But I want you to notice there, it goes on to say, And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. Then all of them, I'm sorry, to all of them, he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father, he sent after this manner 10 asses laden with the good things of Egypt and 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. Amen. Think with me about that. See that ye fall not out by the way. What are the implications of that statement, beloved? As Joseph is there saying, see that ye fall not out by the way. Well, first of all, his brethren have came out, and they, they're coming out of Egypt now with boatloads of money, with nice new clothes and everything else. And Joseph's words to them were, see that ye fall not out by the way. Now, why were those instructions needed? You see, because when his brethren were there with Joseph, and they realized that Joseph is the one that they're talking to, you know where they're supposed to go next. Their next stop is back home. Who are they going to talk to back home? Dear old dad. Well, they have to go before their dad, and they have to say, hey, dad, guess who we found in Egypt? You know how we found his coat with that blood on it and gave that to you? Well, guess who's alive down in the land of Egypt? And Big Daddy's going to be saying, I thought he was torn by the beast. Well, we, we thought he was too. And in their minds, they may be wondering, I wonder if Dad is going to come down here and say, well, Joseph, what was it like with you when you were fighting with that beast where they got blood on your coat? And Joseph says, what beast? There was never any beast. Well, what about the blood on your coat? Well, that was never my blood. Well, Joseph, what exactly happened to you? I mean, you've been going all this time, all these years. What's going on, Joseph? What happened to you? Well, Dad, you see your other sons here? We do not know if Joseph told them all the story. We know Joseph continued to say that God was the one who had brought them. I believe spiritually speaking, that was exactly what he told them. But the point is, beloved, that there came a day of reckoning upon the lives of Joseph's brethren. Where any question at all, because if that were your son down there that you hadn't seen for 20 years, what would be one of the first questions you would ask? What happened? How did you get separated from your brethren? And if you were to tell the truth of it, you could take say, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't know what Joseph did. 
I personally believe that he told his dad. We'll see that in the weeks to come. I believe that he told his dad somewhat of what happened, but I do not believe that it was for the purpose of malicious intent because of the way that Joseph's dad addressed his other brethren when he was on his deathbed, but that will be for future. But the point is, beloved, that Joseph's brethren, they're now in this position and they have all of these wagons, and they have these asses laden down with all of the goods here, and they have all of these provisions, all of these nice new duds. And you know what the brethren could have done? We're not going back to Dad. If we go back and we get Dad and we take Dad down here uh, to meet up with Joseph, I'm telling you what, our fish are fried if we do that. We're going to be in big trouble. And I wonder, beloved, I'm not putting thoughts in the mind of those men, but I'll tell you right now, I, I, in and of my flesh, I'm wicked enough person that I would have had to think twice, do I want to head back and tell Dad about everything that's going on, or w do we just want to ride off in the sunset some other way and enjoy these clothing and enjoy all these stuff that we have received from the land of Egypt because they knew that they would have been in trouble. But Joseph tells them there, he says, See that ye fall not out by the way, and lo and behold, it goes on to say, And they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, and he believed them not. Believe them not. Believe them not. I wonder if there's a problem with the credibility of Joseph's brethren. You think? The brethren are there saying, yeah, Joseph's alive. And the fathers, they say, I just can't hardly believe it. But it goes on to say, and they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father was revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. I wonder if Jacob had come to the place that he was somewhat moping around, waiting on a time to die. In other words, I wonder, beloved, if Jacob was to that point that he just felt like, well, my life is just a miserable mess and everything else. One of my sons is going, the famine's upon us. But the Bible says there, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And in verse 27 it says there, And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived, just simply realizing that his son was alive. In other words, I don't believe he's out there checking those wagons out saying, Boy, someone did a good job sanding this wagon. Man, the wheels are perfectly round. They're just look at the way that this wagon's built. It wasn't the wagons, beloved, that revived his spirit. It was knowledge that his son was yet alive. Beloved, for us, the people of God, some of the greatest joy that we can ever have in our life, I believe that it is our chief joy is to always bear in mind that we serve a risen Savior. We serve a risen Savior. We don't serve a dead God. Let the White House do what they want to. We serve a risen Savior. Let the stock market do what it wants to. We serve a risen Savior. Let times get as bad as they want to get, beloved. We still serve a risen Savior. And when we're able to take and keep these things in our minds, in our hearts, all of the things of this world should grow strangely dim as we keep our minds and our affections and our hearts upon the fact that we do indeed serve a risen Savior. Beloved, can anything else be so precious to the people of God? We have a sure route into heaven because of what Christ Jesus has done for us there upon the cross of Calvary. Now think with me about this. Can you imagine as, as Pharaoh had said there to him, regard not your stuff for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Could you imagine if Jacob had some kind of an old dilapidated, we'll say loaf of bread for the sake of illustration or a clump of cheese. Could you imagine if he had been saying, no, let, let me get my clump of cheese now. Let me get this old moldy loaf of bread. Dad, don't worry about the moldy loaves of bread. There's thousands upon thousands of loaves of bread that your son sent you, thousands of loaves of bread in the land of Egypt. What are you worried about, Dad? No, I, I just want to get this moldy loaf of my bread. 
Have you ever seen people like that? Have you ever been that person? What I mean by that, we had told you folks a story many years ago that uh, there was a flood which hit a portion of the Philippines at one time, and people were drowning. People were getting up on the roofs of their houses and everything else, and they sent a boat out, and a man had his television set, and then his wife was also there. And the rescuers on the boat pulled up to the front door of the house. They said, come on, get in the boat, get in the boat. And he said, well, i got to bring my TV. And they said, it's either your wife or the TV set. And the story goes, according to the newspaper, that the man hesitated for a while because he wasn't sure which one to bring. And his name was Philip Preston. No, I'm just kidding you, <laughs> Brother Preston. But the truth is, beloved, we look at that man and we say, well, what, what kind of a person would hesitate between their wife and a television set? I mean, it, it should have been a no-brainer, and it should have been. But this man had some misplaced affections, beloved. What is it, brother? I got a room for you, buddy, amen. But honestly, beloved, how often times do we hold on to the things of this life and the things of this world? And we know that they're fleeting we know that they're fading away, but yet oftentimes we will allow material possessions, the things of this life, closing, house, cars, any number of things, we will allow the things of this life to determine whether or not we're joyful one day or whether or not we're sad one day. Beloved, our joy should not be wrapped up in the material things. I think of the expression someone had written in years gone by that they said, uh, for years he lived on me and called me his with regards to a great landowner somewhere. For years he lived on me and called me his, and now he lives in me, and I call him mine. Think about it. Beloved, the joyful news, though, is this. Jacob is now headed down to the land of Egypt. He's on the way to see his son. Beloved, one day we also, we are en route to see the only begotten Son of God. We're en route to the promised land, far greater than Egypt, but we're en route, beloved. The means has been provided, the way has been paved, and God is bringing his children along. May we never lose sight of that. Let me ask you folks this. When are you most excited? It may be somewhat of a loaded question. Are you more excited when you're going on vacation or when you're coming home from vacation? Any input? Coming home? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Seemed to me like that it's kind of a twofold thing with regards to going out and coming in. But the truth is, beloved, that we're headed home. We're not getting further from heaven. We're getting closer with each passing day. May this serve, beloved, to strengthen our hearts during times of trouble, whatever the trouble may be. May we find our strength and our courage in the Lord. Let's